Welcome, everyone. My name is Rachel Massey, and I'm the Senior Science and Policy Advisor with CHE, the Collaborative for Health and Environment. Today's webinar is the final installment of a three-part series exploring chemicals in building products, disproportionate exposures, and implications for children's health. This series is co-hosted by the Collaborative for Health and Environment, Blue Green Alliance, the Program for Reproductive Health and the Environment at UCSF, and Healthy Building Network, in partnership with Green Building Alliance, the Center for Environmental Health, and the Children's Environmental Health Network. If you'd like to watch the recordings of the first two webinars in the series, you can review those on our website. We'll put those links into the chat in case that's useful. A few bits of housekeeping before we start. If you're joining by phone, you can download the slides from the webinar page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. And for those who are online, we'll put that link into the chat now. Please feel free to put a note in the chat introducing yourself if you'd like to. We will also be putting links into the chat during the presentations for those of you who'd like to see the specific resources that the speakers are referring to in real time. And we look forward to your comments and questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box at any point, and we'll get to as many as we can after the presentations. If you'd like to activate closed captions, you can do that by clicking the button on the bottom of your screen. This webinar is scheduled to last for an hour and is being recorded. Depending how many questions there are, we may go just a couple of minutes beyond that one hour mark. We have an excellent group of speakers joining us today, and I hope you will find all the information they present to be useful in your own work. I'm really pleased to start by introducing Nseidu Obut Witherspoon, who will give an introduction and moderate the, the discussion. Nsei is the Executive Director for the Children's Environmental Health Network. She organizes, leads, and manages equity-driven child protective policy, education, training, and technical assistance opportunities, and science-related programs. For the past 23 years, she has served as a key spokesperson for children's vulnerabilities and the need for their protection. She is a leader in the field of children's environmental health, serving on the External Science Board for Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes, ECHO, NIH research work, She's a co-leader of the Health Science Initiative of the Cancer-Free Economy Network, co-chair of the National Environmental Health Partnership Council, and lead chair of Clean Water for All. She's a steering co committee member for the National Environmental Network and the Lead Service Line Replacement Collaborative. And there is a leadership award named in her honor, the Nseidu Obut Weatherspoon, or now, Youth Leadership Award, and she's the recipient of many, many honors and awards herself. And say thank you so much for taking time to join us today. I'd like you to invite you now to start today's conversation. And say thank you so much, Rachel, Kristen, and our friends at Che. We really, all of us, appreciate these very useful uh, public webinars for all of our work. It's an honor to be with all of you today, and I believe we're going to have a really important discussion today as well around healthy housing. The Children's Environmental Health Network relies on many key partners, such as the National Center for Healthy Housing who remind us daily that products used to clean, light, furnish, renovate and build our childcare facilities, schools, homes and workspaces can impact our health significantly. Such potential chemicals include exposures to asbestos that's commonly used in floor and ceiling tiles, plasters, insulations, adhesives, wall boards, fireproofing materials, cement products and on and on. Asbestos is a known carcinogen that can cause respiratory concerns. Formaldehyde is used widely to manufacture building materials and numerous household products. It's also a byproduct of combustion and certain other natural processes. It's also a known respiratory irritant and a carcinogen. Perfluoroalkyl uh, compounds, fluorinated compounds, excuse me, PFCs are a family of fluorine containing chemicals with unique properties to make materials stain and stick resistant, such as including PFOA and PFOS, also likely carcinogens. Polybrominated diethyl ethers are another example, or PBDEs. They're used as flame retardants in plastic building materials and are particularly widespread in polyurethane foam products, insulation, and cushions. So while we do have science and lived experience to show us that building materials often contain harmful chemicals, like those mentioned, 
and pollutants that can cause a variety of health problems, including respiratory issues, headaches, allergic reactions, tumors, and cancers. We have yet as a society to see the wide scale paradigm shift necessary to create broader protections in our indoor environments. The negative effects of toxic building materials on children and the broader public can be severe and long lasting on our health as well as on our healthcare and insurance markets. For example, exposure to these materials can lead to the development of asthma, the number one chronic childhood illness still in the United States and other chronic respiratory conditions which can require ongoing medical treatment and medication. Health impacts from chemical exposures fall disproportionately upon marginalized communities, people of color, low wealth uh, workforces, and children, to name a few. Over many decades, the discriminatory practices and practices that constitute environmental racism have disproportionately burdened indigenous, black and brown neighborhoods with polluting facilities such as toxic waste sites, landfills, and chemical plants. And at the same time, environmental racism and redlining practices have also concentrated disadvantaged populations in substandard housing, in high-risk conditions, and compromised communities, where hazardous exposures are much more prevalent. These cumulative exposures have generational impacts. Children are particularly vulnerable to the effects of toxic insulation and chemicals and drywalls and paints and many of these building materials, as they spend a lot of time indoors like most of us on the floors where these materials are often found in abundance and with their hand to mouth behavior, all putting them at risk. Children's developing bodies are also more susceptible to the negative effects of different toxins, making them more at risk for developing health problems and cancers as a result of exposures to the materials daily and long-term. The cost of treating the health problems caused by toxic building products can be significant. According to a 2017 study by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the annual cost of treating childhood asthma in the United States alone is estimated to be over $3 billion annually. The cost of further is exacerbated by the fact that many of these health problems may require ongoing medical treatment and medication throughout the life of that child, which can also add up to a significant expense over time, including lost days of work and school. The estimated annual cost of childhood cancer annually is 35 million with one in five families living in poverty receiving diagnosis. So there are serious connections there as well. Over 13 years ago, the Children's Environmental Health Network launched the Eco Healthy Child Care Program due to these identified concerns, especially considering the fact that 60% of our children, anywhere from six weeks to five years of age, are in some form of childcare, most of which are in home childcare settings. Our program is working to train and educate child care professionals and facility owners and managers on low to no cost options available to them. Much of our work is connected to building materials and promoting healthier and safer indoor environments. I'm a proud board member of the Healthy Building Network, a national program co-created uh, with affordable housing practitioners and designers to improve the health of all people and the planet, especially the most vulnerable and the most marginalized. One of their efforts, called Home Free works to shine a light on toxic chemical exposures and transform the built environment by empowering decision makers to identify and use safer building products through available resources and tools. As toxic chemicals and building products are among the sources of exposure to key chemicals of concern, there are opportunities for the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to address these exposures through improved implementation of the Toxic Substances Control Act, known as TSCA. In addition, there are also opportunities for the federal government to direct resources towards construction and retrofitting of healthier homes, affordable green chemistry solutions that support a healthy, successful circular economy. I'm happy to move us into our fantastic presenters today and our discussion afterwards. Our first speaker will be Harley Stokes, who's the policy advisor at Blue Green Alliance and who leads policy development advocacy and network engagement for green buildings, health initiatives, and equity. Before joining BGA, Harley worked for several years on global food security and climate change through policy, advocacy, and technical implementation. Harley received her Bachelor of Arts in Africana and Hispanic Studies from Vassar College and a dual master's degree in international affairs and global health from the George Washington University, my alma mater. 
Harley will discuss how the construction of or retrofitting of a building or home provides an opportunity to address disproportionate exposures by utilizing healthy building materials. Thank you so much, Harley. Thank you so much, Ense. And Rachel is going to help me out with the slides. So I'll just wait one moment while we get those loaded up. Thanks, Rachel. Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harley Stokes and I am a federal policy advisor with Blue Green Alliance. My portfolio includes buildings, health and equity, and we're gonna talk about all three today. Next slide. So Blue Green Alliance or BGA as we call it is a unique coalition of labor unions and environmental groups. And you can see the logos of our partners on this slide. Next slide. We work on a number of issues at the intersection of environment and the clean energy economy. We believe that we don't have to choose between a good job and a clean environment. We can and must have both. So for my portfolio, this means advocating for buildings, including homes and schools that are energy efficient, climate resilient and healthy and that they're built or retrofitted with high road labor standards. Building off of what we talked about in the first two webinars in this series on disproportionate exposure to toxic chemicals for children and communities of color. Today I'm going to talk about two places where children spend most of their time, which is in their homes and in school. <clears throat> so we learned earlier in the webinar series, the myriad ways there are disproportionate exposures to um, chemicals for children and communities of color, particularly in the built environment. These toxic chemicals commonly found in building materials, such as floor insulation and paint, make their way through the skin or into the air and dust particles. Several studies have found that chemicals and dust are found in higher concentrations in low-income communities of color. We also learned in webinar, <clears throat> webinar one about the life cycle of these building materials from hazardous releases in the manufacturing process all the way through to the disposal of these products um, where which harm low income and communities of color that often live at the fence line of these facilities. Um, and NSA did a great job sort of outlining all of the health impacts that come with that exposure. So now I want to talk about what are some <clears throat> funding resources that are available to, to try to address this particular aspect of getting healthier building materials into homes. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as bill, or you might have heard of it as IIJA. It was passed in 2021 and provided funding outside of the annual budget process for building sector programs, among many other infrastructure programs. So the weatherization assistance program, it's, it's a longstanding Department of Energy program, but they received an extra 3.5 billion. And that's distributed through state and local agencies for low income households to retrofit their homes to be more energy efficient. And there's opportunity there when those retrofits happen to utilize the healthier building materials. I also wanted to flag the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, also known as LIHEAP, that received 550 million. Um, this funding is typically for households that spend a higher percentage of their income towards energy bills, which is usually um, low income and communities of color. It's, they typically pay two to three times more than white counterparts for um, energy bills. So this is a really important program and 15 to 25% of LIHEAP funds can be used also towards weatherization. So that means that procuring some of those healthier building materials is also possible through that funding. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight the pollution prevention grant received 100 million for EPA to distribute to state, tribal and local governments and the purpose of this grant is to increase access to safer and more sustainable project products, particularly for disadvantaged communities. So that's yet another opportunity for 
a project to design um, where there is healthy building material procurement. I also wanted to lift up some funding that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act. So this was passed in 2022. It very much complements what was in the bill with uh, additional investments into the clean energy economy and especially into uh, energy efficient buildings. So what I wanted to highlight was um, HUD received 1 billion for green and resilient retrofits. So that's money that can go to an affordable housing property owner to retrofit a property to be healthier, climate resilient and energy efficient. There was also a large sum of money, 9 billion, that is going to go out to states to stand up um, rebate programs. So this will be for residential retrofits and it'll be um, rebates that can go towards things like improved insulation, uh, more efficient appliances and that sort of thing. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight were two existing tax credits um, that also have to do with either um, retrofitting an existing home 45L or in the construction of a new home 25C, when it's built with energy efficiency in mind, you can receive a tax credit. And that's another opportunity um, to have a healthy building materials in that process. I also want to talk about schools. Um, healthy schools matter because one in six people in the US either work or learn in a school building. The average school building is 55 years, 55 years old, and that comes with a number of health concerns for building occupants. Um, the condition of inadequate school facilities can include exposure to mold, poor indoor air quality, temperature control, noisy conditions, um, but even more sinister than that is this I uh, NSA mentioned around legacy toxics. So this includes lead, asbestos, and polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. And in school buildings that were built between 1950 and 1980, um, they often have these legacy toxics that have these known or probable carcinogens. And just to illustrate, the, for PCBs in particular, there are an estimated 13,000 to 26,000 school buildings that have PCBs in them. And it, it'll cost about 2 million to remediate that. And the majority of the schools that need that are located in low income areas and commun communities of color. And just more generally, research shows that as uh, the percentage of students who qualify for reduced cost lunch increases, the quality of the school building decreases. And schools with higher enrollment of students from low income families are more likely to report that those buildings are in fair or poor condition. Um, and those school buildings are typically located in low income and minority communities. So I also wanted to raise up the funding that's available specifically for schools and school retrofits. Um, because right now there's an annual spending gap of about 85 billion in deferred maintenance across the US. So the first one is in the bill. It's the it's a new program called Renew America Schools. Um, it's 500 million and it targets high poverty and rural school districts for energy efficient retrofits or renewable energy. In the Inflation Reduction Act, they created an, an EPA program specifically to target indoor air pollution in schools. So that's you know a program where, for example, you could utilize money for remediation of PCBs and in that retrofit, you could also procure healthy building materials. And then the last um, item I wanted to flag was it's an existing tax credit, but it got expanded to tax exempt institutions. So now public schools, for example, are eligible for this tax credit and they can take, they can pass those, uh, that tax uh, deduction onto whichever company is retrofitting the school and then get the savings themselves. 
Another thing I wanted to just highlight is um, the Blue Green Alliance Foundation has a buildingclean.org website. And when in my position, I'm advocating for healthy building materials, um, let's say in federal uh, procurement guidance or at the state agency level, I'll often refer to our good, better, best criteria as a way to approach how to eliminate the worst of um, the toxic building materials. So when we say it's, it's a good, the good certification, it means product certifications and labels ensure low volatile organic compound emissions. Even better is when product certifications and labels limit some of the most hazardous content. And best, of course, being that those certifications and labels are free of the most hazardous content. So I encourage you to um, take, a, take a peek at buildingclean.org. You can find ways to um, identify healthy building materials, and then you can see in your search where it falls in that criteria. I also wanted to lift up Justice 40 just because we're talking about federal funding and Justice 40 is a federal initiative basically mandating that federal agencies that are working on that have environmental or climate or clean energy programs need to ensure that 40% of the benefits of those programs go to disadvantaged communities. So when EPA or HUD or DOE is doing the, the different programs that I highlighted, um, they need to make sure that at least 40% of the benefits go to these communities. So if you're thinking about some of the programs that have competitive grants, one way to ensure that the project design is competitive is to, to demonstrate that the project will benefit um, disadvantaged communities. So I want to make sure make sure to make that link. And then last, I just wanted to make a quick plug. Um, BGA has a tool coming out, a public buildings roadmap. So if you are interested in the public buildings side of it, the school piece, um, it will be a deeper dive into that for schools, nonprofit hospitals, municipal buildings, um, and sort of outlining what's in the bill, what's in the Inflation Reduction Act and how to utilize that funding for retrofits that are holistic, so energy efficient, climate resilient, and healthy. And with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Nick Chartres. Thank you so much, Harley. Uh, really appreciate that. And just a reminder, everyone, you can start using the Q&A function as you start to have questions. And we'll definitely, after the next uh, set of presentation here, we'll open it up and have a, a helpful discussion. I want to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Nick Chatres, uh, is the Associate Director of Science and Policy at the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment at the University of California, San Francisco, which has been at the forefront in research translation methods in environmental health and identifying evidence-based policies to prevent exposures to harmful environmental chemicals. In his role, he monitors and analyzes federal, state, and local uh, chemical policy, including the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's implementation of the amended Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA, the law that evaluates and regulates industrial chemicals, including those used in building materials in U.S. commerce. Nick will discuss the opportunities for TSCA to play a critical role in limiting or preventing the manufacture and use of toxic substances in building materials. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, Ense, uh, for those kind words and to Harley for your excellent presentation. I think Rachel is going to share my slides as well. Thanks, Rachel. I can see them popping up. Fantastic. Uh, so as Ense said, a lot of my work um, and our work here at PRE is focused on the Toxic Substance Control Act and how EPA implements it. If you don't know what it is, don't worry. I'm going to talk a bit about it in a moment, but it's a really important policy lever uh, to regulate chemicals in commerce uh, and obviously also those that are used in, in building materials more specifically. Um, and we're going to use a case study today on formaldehyde and asthma um, to demonstrate um, some of the methods that we, we think EPA should be implementing to ensure um, you know, appropriate and, and fully um, health protective recommendations and regulations. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, I have no conflicts to disclose, so I'll go on to the, the next slide. Thanks, Rachel. 
So there are very varying policy frameworks currently applied to address chemicals in commerce and industrial pollution across the world. And I'm showing two here. One is in the EU under the Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals, also known as REACH. Uh, and under REACH, the obligation is on chemical manufacturers and importers to generate data on potential chemical exposures and toxicity, to use this information to develop and apply appropriate risk management measures, but also to submit this information to the European Chemical Agency, also known as ECHA, uh, and that's the EU body that makes uh, the regulatory decisions around chemicals. In the US, we have multiple laws governing environmental chemicals, and this includes major laws at the federal level administered by the US EPA, but also by other agencies, including, for example, OSHA for occupational exposures to chemicals. Uh, but what's consistent across these US laws, unlike in the EU, unlike in the EU the onus is placed on the government to identify and request data from industry to evaluate potential chemical toxicity. And the Toxic Substance Control Act is the primary authority that regulates non-pesticide chemicals. And so that leaves us with about 86,000 chemicals registered for use in commerce under TOSCA's purview. So things like methylene chloride in paint strippers, uh, formaldehyde in building materials, and lots of flame retardants in upholstered furniture. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. So under, in 1976, when TOSCA was first introduced, chemicals already in commerce were assumed to be safe uh, until shown harmful. And the original law was widely viewed as weak and ineffective. And in the 40 years from its original enactment to its amendments in 2016, EPA regulated fewer than 10 of the over 86,000 existing chemicals registered for use in commerce I just mentioned. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. And various factors uh, set the stage to update TOSCA via the Frank Lutenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act, also known as Amended TOSCA, uh, which took place in 2016. Amended TOSCA requires EPA to do some important things, which I'm just going to cover here because they're going to be important when we talk more about um, some of the methods later on. Firstly, they need to conduct risk evaluations of chemicals in commerce on a pre-specified schedule. But to consider risks to potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations and determine if a chemical poses an unreasonable risk without consideration of cost. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with potentially exposed and susceptible subpopulations, the groups of individuals within, uh, within the wider population that have greater susceptibility or greater exposure uh, and therefore greater risk than general population. And they include populations such as infants, children, pregnant women, workers, or the elderly. Uh, and finally, at the bottom, this is an important one because we're going to talk a lot about this today. It requires EPA to use scientific information, technical procedures, measures, methods, protocols, methodologies, or models employed in a manner consistent with the best available science. We're going to come back to that a few times today. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. But TOSCA is broken, unfortunately, uh, and the promise of the 2016 amendments has not kept up with the reality. We conducted an analysis of the implementation of TOSCA in a pub paper that we published in uh, ES&T. We looked at the first 10 chemical risk evaluations EPAs conducted under the amended TOSCA that I mentioned in 2016. And as you can see here on the screen, we found that EPA's risk evaluations systematically underestimated human health risks of chemical exposures particularly vulnerable populations by not considering things such as aggregate exposure and cumulative risk, and also using a highly flawed systematic review method to identify and evaluate the relevant evidence. Uh, EPA is slowly addressing some of these issues, but not to a great enough extent or in a timely enough manner. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. And it's important because despite these flaws, EPA is continuing its risk evaluations. And what you can see here on the screen is the next 20 chemicals that are currently being evaluated uh, under TOSCA. There are six phthalates, chlorinated solvents, flame retardants, and you can see I've uh, circled formaldehyde there as well. And fully characterising the risks for health endpoints identified in these risk evaluations, and then considering the downstream benefits of restricting the manufacture of industrial chemicals used in building products like formaldehyde, on impacted communities and users is critical to support EPA in taking appropriate action to protect the public's health. So again, it's gonna be really important that they use the best of available science to do this. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. And a key issue that we've been focused on, I'll get you to just uh, advance because I think this requires a double click, sorry, Rachel. There we go, thanks. The key issue that we're focusing on here at PRE uh, in how EPA conducts these next 20 and all future risk evaluations 
In addition to the other issues I've already shown you, so you know, there's issues that we've highlighted already and we're going to stay engaged on those um, and they still need to rectify those. But we're also very much focused on how EPA um, doesn't quantify uh, health risks for non-cancer health effects uh, for toxic chemicals at the moment. So what that means is they don't quantify the number of people at risk of outcomes of things like asthma, diabetes, dementia, and CVD, et cetera, um, at different levels of exposure. And therefore, what that means is they can't quantify the benefits from reducing the risks from those uh, health outcomes when they go to regulate. And we're going to talk about that now. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. Just to give you a quick primer, um, and this is not to get too in the weeds, but just to help you understand what the key issue here is. Currently, health risks from environmental exposures um, is assessed using two different methods for cancer, first non-cancer health effects. And the difference has several important implications. So I'm just gonna take you through this slowly. Firstly, for non-cancer health effects, so things like asthma, um, dementia, CVD, health risk assessments assume there's a safe level of exposure to an environmental chemical that doesn't increase risk of disease as a result of exposure. They say exposures above that safe level are assumed to increase risk of illness and exposures below are not expected to increase risk of illness. However, this method doesn't quantify or describe the risk of developing a disease at any level of exposure. On the other hand, when we're looking at chemical risk, risk assessments assume that any exposure to a carcinogen increases our risk of developing cancer. And typically, an acceptable level of risk is defined as an additional one in 100,000 excess cancer cases due to the chemical exposure. And having quantified that relationship between the chemical and the risk of cancer, it makes it possible to perform cost benefits analyses and place a dollar value on the healthcare and related savings associated with improving environmental quality among other important benefits. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. Go one more, sorry, advance again. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an example of why quantifying risk for all health effects, both cancer and non-cancer is so important in developing health protective regulations using a case study on formaldehyde. So why formaldehyde? Because it's a high volume production chemical with numer numerous industrial and commercial uses. It's present in many household products such as foam insulation, pressed wood products such as particle board and plywood. And as a result, in common indoor air and as a result, it's a common indoor air pollutant found virtually in all homes. Uh, in particular, formaldehyde is an environmental justice and an affordable housing concern with lower income communities disproportionately at risk of exposure to formaldehyde and the resulting health effects. I'll get you to click once to advance. There are two well-known case studies. Uh, this is the uh, um, a well-known one um, around Katrina issued FEMA trailers where um, health issues started being reported back in, two th in the early 2000s. Um, and health effects were due to substandard building materials included, uh, included, sorry, due to the building materials included in these trailers. Um, and those health effects that were identified um, included headaches, breathing difficulties, flu symptoms, and eye irritations with other health effects. And another example, I'll get you to click ahead again, is a 60 minute story which highlighted how lumber liquidators selling Chinese made flooring had extremely high levels of formaldehyde. And these new homes were having the same health issues as those reported in the FEMA trailers. And given these potential health effects and disparities in exposure, it's obviously critical that we regulate these exposures fully. So I'll get you to go to the next slide, thanks. So there's a 30 year story of EPA trying to regulate formaldehyde. I'm gonna take you through it reasonably quickly. Um, EPA, EPA released its review of formaldehyde health risks uh, in something called an Integrated Risk Information System Assessment back in 1990. Uh, it initiated a reassessment in 1998, uh, updating it with new uh, data. And it released a draft report in 2010, which included a review of um, health effects, including asthma. And we're going to look at asthma as a case study. Uh, a review of the draft assessment by the National Academies of Science highlighted many methodological limitations in this IRIS report. And EPA's conclusion of a causal relationship between formaldehyde exposure and asthma incidence uh, and its subsequent derivation of a, a reference concentration was ultimately challenged by the NAS committee. At the same time, or near the same time in 2010, Congress required EPA to issue a rule on press wood products and emissions of formaldehyde. And ultimately EPA issued a final rule on this in 2016, which you can see at the end of that line graph there. Just to give you some context, in the US, asthma affects approximately 23 million people with 6 million children impacted. And so the emission of asthma from a benefits cost analysis, um, when you're looking at um, formaldehyde, 
could significantly underestimate the true value of regulating formaldehyde in pressable products. And that's a bit of a hint. That's exactly what they did. So we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. EPA initially included asthma in the benefits cost analysis for this proposed rule. Unfortunately, a powerful conglomeration of furniture manufacturers intervened and asthma was removed from the analysis after interagency review. And this is a red line version after the Office of Management and Budget went through the costs and benefits. And you can see here, there's three different options here, looking at low and high end estimates. And you can see they all get redlined uh, on the right hand side when we see this, um, when we're looking at the uh, benefits and the net benefits with significant decreases in those benefits from the original uh, benefits that were listed. I'll get you to go to the next slide, thanks. So after OMB redlines EPA's estimated monetary benefits related to preventing asthma uh, and infertility um, was another outcome they redlined. It caused the benefits to drop from $278 million to $48 million per year. And although the rationale for the redlining bloodbath is never explicitly stated, it's likely um, due to the questions surrounding the association between formaldehyde exposure and asthma outcomes. And so this is a page from a very well-known uh, industry tactic, uh, from, from their work, very well-known playbook, I should say, and it's a tactic for striking down regulations that impact their bottom line. So what they do is they cast doubt, doubt on the scientific underpinning supporting associations uh, between chemical exposures and human health outcomes. Um, but luckily, environmental health researchers such as um, the team here at PRE have been catching on to these tactics. And we've been creating our own playbook, um, which highlights front and center the effectiveness of something called a systematic review method to quash questions about the validity of review conclusions and health risks. And I'm gonna talk very briefly on what that is. Go to the next slide, thanks. So to assess the evidence of formaldehyde's contribution to asthma outcomes, we wanted to go and conduct a systematic review to answer the question of whether formaldehyde is associated with diagnoses um, signs, symptoms and exacerbation and other measures of asthma in humans. Um, so why conduct a systematic review? Or for those who don't know what it is, what is it? A systematic review is a gold standard evaluation of the evidence that follows a pre-specified and consistently applied transparent set of rules to reduce bias uh, and to document how the scientific data is integrated to address a specific question. Furthermore, we were able to use it um, for a comprehensive evaluation of the most up-to-date scientific information uh, and use it in our um, evaluation of the monetized benefits of reducing asthma in the US. So we actually could use it in terms of doing um, a benefits cost analysis. And we, we reuse those results um, from the quantitative evaluation of the evidence to estimate the benefits uh, from reducing asthma in, in, um, in, in cases from a formaldehyde restriction. We'll go to the next slide, thanks. So basically, very quickly, what do we find? When we went and did this systematic review, we had one general outcome, which was asthma, but we had to separate it out. We separated it by symptoms and then by diagnoses. Uh, and then we separated it out by age as well. So children under the age of 15 and adults. So we ended up with four categories. And what you can see here on the screen is a meta-analysis, which for those who don't know, it's basically where we combine uh, a number of individual studies together that have uh, a similar enough set of um, characteristics, so populations and exposures and outcomes. And the reason why we combine them together is we get a, a, a greater overall effect estimate that's more precise. And that's what you can see circled at the bottom in the red there. So it gives us a more um, accurate answer to whether there is a true association. And in this meta-analysis that you can see with all these studies combined, looking at the same question, whether children, um, whether sorry, formaldehyde was associated with children asthma diagnoses, we found that there was uh, a significant association with increased odds of 8% per 10% uh, uh, sorry per tenfold uh, exposure increase. We'll go to the next slide. Thanks. In our second meta-analysis, um, we looked this time at whether there was an association with formaldehyde um, and asthma symptoms, so wheezing and shortness of breath. Uh, and we found a similar association, so an 8% increase per tenfold exposure, but this time it wasn't statistically significant. So what does all this mean? I'll get you to go to the next slide. We went and conducted then an economic evaluation um, and we found that EPA's proposed rule on press wood would have resulted in 2,800 fewer cases of asthma 
leading to a total economic benefit of $210 million per year if it was included in that benefits analysis. And we used uh, EPA's own approach for estimating the benefits, it's something called willingness to pay, which I won't go into um, in a huge amount of detail, but it's basically how much people or an individual be willing to pay to reduce the probability of an adverse health effect assumed to be related to formaldehyde exposure. I'll get you to the next slide. So the OMB's monetized benefits value of $48 million would have actually increased to $258 million per year if they had quantified the health benefits of asthma, so this non-cancer health effect. And not only is it a huge amount of economic benefit, but obviously we would have avoided a huge number of asthma cases as well. We'll go to the next slide. The key takeaway I want you to take from this is that it's critical for policy decisions to account for but also quantify all relevant health outcomes to avoid an underestimation of benefits. Uh, and if you don't quantify non-cancer health effects like asthma, you're not gonna be able to see the monetary potential benefits that I've just shown you um, in this case study. So I'll get you to go to the next slide. So how is all this relevant to um, Tosca? I'm just gonna bring it back to the fact that over the last four years, we've been working with a group known as the Science Action Network, um, which is a collaboration of experts across the US um, uh, to develop a set of recommendations on how EPA can improve their scientific decision-making. They're also applicable to, to any regulatory agency. And we've been dra drafting and we've now just published five scientific papers on how to do this. Um, and I'll get you to go to the next slide. I'm gonna to touch on them very briefly before I close. The first one is uh, an overall consensus statement and it makes five recommendations that you can see here on the screen. Uh, two of them that I'll just touch on briefly is um, ensuring that populations at greatest risk, including those that are more susceptible or more highly exposed, must be better identified and protected to account for their real world risks. And another one is that hazard and risk assessment should not assume existence of a safe or no risk level of a chemical exposure in the population. I'll get you to go to the next slide. And we also have developed four priority areas in companion papers that you can see here on the screen. One's on uh, human variability assessment, one's on exposure assessment methods. Uh, there's also one on, on a framework for defining chemical classes, which is obviously highly pertinent um, because we use a case study within this manuscript to look at um, phthalates uh, as an example. Um, and they, the authors demonstrate how evaluating chemicals by class could be far more health protective. And obviously there's six of those in the, uh, the next 20 risk evaluations uh, under TOSCA. So really important. I'll get you advance one. If you can, and you'll see here, the last paper, which I'm going to touch on briefly, is all about quantifying non-cancer health outcomes. Uh, and like I said at the top of today's talk, this has been a real priority focus for us um, in, in, in ensuring that EPA actually implements this methodology. So I'll get you to go to the next slide. And so what did we find in this manuscript? We actually did a case study. I just wanted to quickly touch on the results before I close, because this is a, a really important example to show um, the difference in health risks that can be captured when you use these types of methods. So we went and used um, a, a TOSCA risk evaluation that was looking at uh, perchloroethylene, which is a chemical um, applied as a stain remover in dry cleaning. Um, we used something called a pro probabilistic approach, basically these methods to um, identify the probability or risk of developing a disease at any exposure level, including below that reference value I've been talking about. And what we found was this, this risk assessment um, was looking at whether uh, PCE um, increases um, visual memory function or decreases, uh, sorry, decreases visual memory function. And our probabilistic assessment showed that this visual memory function is adversely affected at exposure levels below EPA's current safe level at a level of one in 1,000. So that means if your exposure is at the current reference value or safe level that EPA sets, there's a high likelihood that your visual memory performance will be negatively affected. And as I said before, by comparison, EPA regulates chemicals at the moment that increase risk of cancer to exposure levels that are not expected to cause more than a one in 100,000 chance of increased risk. So we're talking about one in 1,000 with the example we had in PCE, and we're talking normally a safe level of one in 100,000 for cancer risk. Um, so the takeaway for this is we, we're gonna push very hard for EPA to use these methods so they can fully quantify uh, the risks at all levels of exposure. And as you've seen with our formaldehyde um, case study, that data then can be used to, to monetize the benefits of reducing those um, health effects and health harms. I'll get you to go to the next slide. Just to wrap, I mean, sorry, this is really critical. I mean, this information is, 
are so important because we can't um, achieve um, things such as President Biden's regulatory review, review memorandum that was um, released in early 2021 that states we need to take into account the distribution of consequences of regulations and to ensure that regulatory initiatives appropriately benefit and don't uh, inappropriately burden disadvantaged populations. And we can't do that if we don't have the full benefits um, of <clears throat> regulations. Um, and you're not going to get that information unless you apply these methods, these scientific methods I touched on before. Um, the last two slides, how can you be involved in this? What does all this mean for someone who isn't working you know, in this space? There are lots of opportunities. You can certainly be part of EPA decision making. You can reach out to EPA officers. You can reach out to um, the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention and uh, set up meetings to talk about our manuscripts and to talk about what you've heard today. You can be engaged with public comments um, and you can sign on to public comments when opportunities come up. We're going to be focused, like I said, very much on these next 20 risk evaluations and highlighting the flaws and, and touching on the examples I've given today. Um, and also when risk management, when, when rules come out about how EPA has been um, considering what the, the benefits are, um, seeing if they've fully quantified all those potential benefits is critical. And again, being engaged in that process. Um, and finally, if you want to see and hear more about the work we're doing, we're, we're conducting a Hill briefing. I'll get you to the last slide. Thanks, Rachel. The Hill briefing in March or March 29. Um, the link is going to be dropped in the chat. Please um, uh, register yourself to be in attendance. We're going to be covering our manuscripts and, and why EPA needs to be implementing these to ensure um, you know, we're, we're fully protecting the most vulnerable populations um, from you know, these, uh, these toxic exposures. Thank you very much. Nick, thank you. This is uh, very helpful information and we encourage everyone to start posting your questions, um, points, uh, concerns. <laughs> uh, this is a wealth of resources that have been posted and continue to be posted. Thank you so much to the CHE team for helping with all that. Um, I have initial, some initial questions to get us going. Nick, uh, you had mentioned there that uh, the push, of course, would be to continue to engage in the many ways that you put towards the end there and share the results of your work with EPA. Um, and of course, encouraging everyone to do that and lend our collective voices um, among those mechanisms and others. Uh, what has, has there been any response yet uh, or any feedback so far with the efforts that you all have started to lead? Because most of us out here in the public health, especially vulnerable population, children's environmental health realm are not surprised, right? By any of your cost benefit analysis, it just further supports uh, what community experience for decades has and continues to be in addition to peer reviewed science that is readily available. Um, so just, just wondering what any initial thoughts uh, or feedback or reactions have been from the EPA side that you might be able to share. Thanks, it's, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, um, I, I touched on the fact that we obviously did our original analyses um, and published that last year. And we presented those findings and we talked to um, the various officers uh, about those findings. Um, and uh, we, we're seeing some, some incremental changes. Um, for instance, a, a, a cumulative risk assessment framework was released last week for public comment by EPA. Um, there's been discussions around how they're going to or uh, well, they did conduct a, a fence line screening methodology to fully capture the you know, um, potential exposures to um, fence line communities in the, the current toxic risk evaluation. So, so there has been some response to the work that we've been doing. But what I also touched on is that the response has been um, insufficient and it's also um, not been done in a time enough manner. I think we, we, you know, we talk about these technical issues we're talking about. Now, quantify non-cancer health effects and we're getting into the weeds. But what this means really is that um, we're unable to fully address the environmental injustices that, that are currently um, taking place. Uh, and these are, these are the things that I think that are, are critical for EPA administration to realise that there are methods and there are processes that can be implemented straight away that can fully quantify these risks, that can put in full health protections uh, for these chemicals. Um, the methods are there, they've been tested, they've been recommended by groups such as the National Academies of Sciences, and there's no reason for EPA not to pick these methods up and use them. Um, so I think that for us has been the challenge that yes, we have been getting some engagement. Um, we have seen some change and we certainly want to acknowledge when there is change. Um, but at the same time, like I said, there, there's a need for greater uh, urgency uh, and there's no reason like I said for the methods that I've described today and in our manuscripts for EPA not to pick those up and implement them straight away within the agency. 
Thank you. Totally agree. And just for a reminder to our listeners, uh, there is an executive order on children's environmental health that is multiple decades now uh, signed during the Clinton-Gore administration, uh, which is supposed to be helping all federal agencies in be encouraged to put the welfare and safety and health of children first. Uh, you know, again, that we are in the year 2023 and still fighting for what I think are pretty basic <laughs> preventive protections uh, from our regulatory agencies and others is is a very interesting point here. Um, so we do have a question from Karen um, and maybe uh, Harley, this is for you. Can you talk more specifically about the IRA and the BIL and what they include for homeowners or builders, contractors to address uh, these related issues? Uh, she says that she's only been hearing about energy efficient tax credits. Are there other credits for choosing healthier products and materials? Thanks, Karen, <clears throat> for that question. Um, so I think what is in there and what I outlined, um, so outside of the, the tax credits uh, for homes, I think the biggest thing will probably be, sorry for the background noise, <laughs> um, the, the biggest thing will probably be the residential retrofit rebate. So, um, you know, the healthier products kind of go hand in hand with those retrofits. So when you are insulating the house or weatherizing it in some way, um, you can opt to use those healthier building materials and then you are getting rebates for um, those products to begin with. So it's sort of, that's, that's the incentive there. So I would say on the home side, whether you're a homeowner or a contractor that will be doing the work that the rebate programs that um, will be stood up through your state energy office, so they're not quite there yet, it's still being rolled out, um, will be the most likely um, relevant pot of money. Thank you so much. And also while we've got you, uh, could you help unpack a little bit more how Justice 40 is intended to work from your vantage point? Sure. So. Uh, one one thing to note, so whether a program is, as I mentioned, a Justice 40 covered program, so that agency is expected to deliver these minimum, you know, 40% benefits to disadvantaged communities, um, or whether it's the program is already in the in the law, in the statutory language, it says, okay, this money has to go to disadvantaged communities, for example. Um, I mentioned the Renew America Schools Grant, that is specifically for, you know, high poverty schools, for example. So in either of those cases, you, there are tools available developed for this initiative that um, can be utilized to say, hey, the community that I'm, I'm working in or designing this project in is disadvantaged. So um, Kristen, if you don't mind popping into the chat, there's one called the um, Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool, and it was developed specifically. Um, one of the main features is a mapping tool, and you can put in a census tract or a zip code um, or a city, and the, the mapping feature will show you whether under the, the different thresholds and indicators that they have come up with that are sort of climate environmental, um, whether that's considered disadvantaged. So it's just one of those tools that can help you when you're um, trying to get through the, the grant process to say, yes, this is benefiting a disadvantaged community. Thank you so much. I just wanna make sure everyone is aware of the Justice 40 Accelerator, for example. Uh, this is in a partnership. It's, it's provided in partnership through the Solutions Project, Elevate, Groundswell, Partnership for Southern Equity, and Hummingbird Firm. And the idea is that a variety of resources and capacity and technical assistance can be provided to tech, uh, frontline uh, communities who plan or want to get ready to apply for federal funds across multiple agencies. So there's informational briefings and resources to learn about these grant opportunities and eligibility and trying to break down the layers of potential barriers and challenges there. There's philanthropic capacity and build grants for dozens of eligible organizations to assist in their capacity and even participating in this technical assistance. 
there's project pre-development workshops, there's partnership opportunities and networking and all kinds of different layers of technical assistance. I know many of us out here wish that something like this was available many, many years ago. So it's fantastic, you know, during this time of, I would say unprecedented levels of capacity coming out of our federal government uh, that is intended to be showing up in our, commu in our communities uh, where there is this assistance factor and they have cohorts. I think they're on cohort 2023 now. So it's fantastic to see the growing number of frontline community oriented groups who are taking advantage and learning and really building their capacity. But uh, Harley, I see your hand up. Yes, just wanted to add, because um, you reminded me, there's also um, the Center for American Progress started a Justice 40 funding tracker. So on the other side of it, if you wanna see the what is already getting funded, that's another resource. And, and Kristen, I'll try to find that for you. Thank you so much. And uh, Nick, did you have any final, any final points you wanted to raise? I don't see any more questions just yet before we wrap up. No, thank you. I think it's just been such a, an excellent webinar series. And, um, you know, obviously uh, the work that I was talking about today seems quite technical, um, but our, you know, it's really important that we focus on these systems level changes and, and try to get outward pressure uh, on EPA and also on, on congressional decision makers because how they evaluate the science, um, obviously, like I said, has huge implications, downstream implications for, for what it means to um, you know, these populations that are, that are exposed. So um, if you aren't familiar with engaging in, in public comments or you would like to learn more, certainly um, you can reach out to anyone at PRE. Uh, our website is um, available for you to contact us and we're, ha we're happy to connect with any groups that are working on, on, anything, on any specific issues or any individuals and to talk more about it. But um, thank you everyone for, for an excellent webinar series and fan safety facilitation. Thank you so much, Nick. And as a reminder, if you happen to be in the DC metro area at the end of this month uh, for that Hill briefing, that might also be a great resource and opportunity uh, for those in your teams and your network. So please do register ahead. There was a link provided. And again, all of this will be available after uh, post webinar as well. I just wanna thank again, Harley and Nick and Che for this fantastic platform. There's a lot of work still to do. There are many opportunities for us to engage. And if you are unsure of how to do that, there are many of our related groups and organizations and networks that are helping to build these engagement platforms with EPA and other agencies and create these sign on letters so you don't necessarily have to do this by yourself. In fact, uh, we're much stronger together. Uh, so thank you all so much. And I'm going to transition back to Rachel just for some closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you and say Nick and Harley for your wonderful work and for your excellent presentations. We really appreciate it. I'll just wrap up with a few quick announcements. Um, first, a video recording will be available on Che's website soon, and everyone who registered for today's session will receive an email with a link to the video. We also invite you to join us for upcoming webinars. On March 22nd, we'll have a 45-minute webinar on the Ohio train derailment. You'll find that link to register in the upcoming webinars section of Che's webpage, and we'll also put that link into the chat. If this is your first time on a CHE webinar, we're really happy you've joined us and we hope you found this information useful. We also host other collaborative programs focused on promoting environmental health and justice. And you may also be interested to explore our science discussion list serves. You can find that information on our homepage at healthandenvironment.org. With that, I'd like to again thank and say Harley and Nick, thanks to all our partners at Blue Green Alliance, Healthy Building Network, and the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment, and especially to Jeff Hurley of Blue Green Alliance for all his work to bring this series together, and to CHE Director Kristen Schaefer for all of her support for this project. Thanks again for joining us.